Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is the last hurrah for the franchise, so you'll be forgiven for having to wipe away a tear or two. Here's what you may not have caught if you were too deep in your feelings. Spoilers ahead. The first MCU film, Iron Man, opened with an animated intro in which the pages of a comic book flipped, eventually revealing the Marvel Studios logo. As more films got added to the franchise, those intros began to feature more Marvel characters, and eventually script pages, live-action scenes from the movies, and the theme music that fans know and love. Every once in a while, Marvel Studios gets creative with its opening title sequence. When they do, it's usually to mark an occasion. For example, the Werewolf by Night Disney Plus special included a Marvel Studios signature that was a throwback to classic monster movies, while the Black Panther Wakanda Forever opening was a tribute to the late Chadwick Boseman. Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 is both the final installment in one of the MCU's most popular mini-franchises and James Gunn's last collaboration with Marvel. So this time, the Marvel Studios' introduction is entirely Guardians of the Galaxy-themed, with images and quotes from the previous installments. Volumes 1 and 2 did not have unique intros, but the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special was preceded by a slightly altered intro, set to Christmas music, in which various Marvel incarnations of Santa are shown, snow is falling, and string lights adorn the Marvel Studios font. The Guardians of the Galaxy first appeared in Marvel Comics in 1969, though that version barely resembles the MCU team. The source material from the films mainly comes from storylines that begin in 2008 when Star-Lord forms a group with Rocket Raccoon, Groot, Gamora, Drax, Phi Lavelle, and Adam Warlock. The first two Guardians of the Galaxy films may have borrowed characters and plot points from the comics, but they gave Star-Lord and his associates unique outfits that were meant to relay information about their personalities. The MCU's Peter Quill was designed to look like a cross between a cowboy and a rock star, with the swagger of both. But for the final film in the trilogy, the team is finally in their comics-accurate suits. The leathery red and blue uniforms with the metallic emblem on the chest very closely adhere to the art of the 2008 Guardian series. The costumes also serve a practical purpose. Dave Bautista has expressed discomfort about playing the physically impressive and often shirtless Drax into his 50s. He's suited up to match his squad in Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3, which allowed Bautista to avoid hours' worth of painstaking body makeup and to relax a little about the state of his physique. Similarly, Drax wears a vest and an ugly Christmas sweater in the Guardians holiday special, which was filmed at the same time. Music is deeply symbolic in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Not only are needle drops specifically chosen to add meaning to moments, the very idea of music as a gift is central to the trilogy. Quill's mom makes him his awesome mixes Volume 1 and 2 in the first film, which he plays on his Walkman until Ego destroys it near the end of the second movie. As that movie draws to a close, Kraglin gives Quill one last present from who became his father figure, Yondu. It's a Zune, Microsoft's version of the iPod, which can hold more and more modern music. Whatever Peter is listening to on his Zune is what the audience hears as well. It's loaded up with tracks that span from Bruce Springsteen's 1978 hit Badlands to Florence and the Machine's 2008 track Dog Days are Over. Whether Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 producers knew it or not, the Beastie Boys' No Sleep Till Brooklyn appears in both of Chris Pratt's films currently in theaters, this one and the Super Mario Bros. movie. In the mid-credits stinger, Rocket mentions that his favorite song is Come and Get Your Love, which is the tune we hear when we first meet Quill rocking out to his Walkman in the first Guardians movie. Music, and this Zune in particular, are so important to Star-Lord that he very nearly dies trying to save it in the vacuum of space in Vol. 3. Star-Lord loves to dance. He idolizes Kevin Bacon in Footloose and uses the power of dance to defeat Ronin in Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 1. When the Guardians first assemble, Quill is the only member who feels comfortable moving and grooving. Baby Groot eventually gives in to the rhythm, but everyone else is reluctant. In the second Guardians film, Drax tells Star-Lord that he fell for his late wife because she was the only woman not dancing at a gathering. She wouldn't even tap her foot. Wouldn't move a muscle. One might assume she was dead. Drax also dissuades Quill from pursuing Gamora because he says there are two types of people, those who dance and those who don't, and Gamora's not a dancer. But Quill teaches Gamora to dance on Ego's planet, and soon they confess their love for each other. In Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3, Drax again insists only idiots dance. Until the very end of the third film, Peter's friends consider dancing silliness, while not dancing is a form of self-seriousness. But after the Guardians rescue the captives from the High Evolutionary's ship and return to nowhere, music plays, and everyone, including Drax and Nebula, starts to boogie. This touching moment symbolizes not only that the Guardians are all true friends, but that there's room for frivolity, even when the galaxy's at stake. 
As a test subject of the high evolutionary Rocket Raccoon's designation, 89P13 is very prominent in Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3. Some savvy fans might remember that code appears elsewhere in Rocket's story. In Vol. 1, when he, Groot, Quill, and Gamora are arrested after their three-way melee on Xandar, the Nova Corps identify him during the prison lineup sequence with the same alphanumeric code. That graphic also includes his rap sheet and his associates, Groot and Lila. We finally get to meet Lila Otter, who is his love interest in the comics in Volume 3. She changes her name from her code, 89Q12. I would like my name to be... Lila. Rocket and Lila's subject codes indicate that they're part of Batch 89 of Experimented Upon Animals. That group also includes Teefs, who goes by Wal Russ in the comics, and Floor, who's probably a riff on Blackjack O'Hare. Sadly, Batch 89 was the last imperfect enough to be kept out of the High Evolutionary's supposedly utopian counter-Earth after a juvenile Rocket's unintentional troubleshooting resulted in Batch 90's success. The P could be an abbreviation for the raccoon's scientific name, Procyon Lotor, and the 13 could merely mean that he's the 13th animal in the test group, though we wouldn't put it past James Gunn to have hidden another secret message in there. A collection of devoted fans, Easter egg hunters, and code breakers have been working on solving a big riddle that James Gunn himself has been teasing for years. The writer-director has seemingly confirmed that some sleuths have gotten close. That theory has to do with Peter Quill's mother, Meredith, possibly having a larger role to play in the MCU's wider story. The evidence for it is a mural on Morag and Peter uttering the word eternity when Ego shows him a vision of his true purpose. Online investigators have also been busy translating the coordinates that appear under the names of planets and other locations in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. So far, those partially cracked codes gave away spoilers for the second and third films, such as Meredith's cancer at the hand of her former lover Ego and the fact that Herbert Wendell the High Evolutionary would be doing experiments in a biomedical clinic. Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 takes audiences to two new locations, the Orgoscope and Counter-Earth. Sure enough, there are new sets of coordinates underneath the names of these celestial bodies. It doesn't necessarily follow that they'd function as spoilers, since Vol. 3 is the last in this trilogy and Gunn won't be involved in more MCU movies. The more likely scenario is that they'll provide the enterprising fans who finally decipher them with a missing piece of information that either completes the infamous Easter egg or adds context to whatever it turns out to be. There are several actors pulling MCU double duty in Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3. Lila Otter is voiced by Linda Cardellini, who played Clint Barton's wife Laura Barton in three MCU films and the Hawkeye TV series. The High Evolutionary's War Pig is voiced by Judy Greer, who also plays Scott Lang's ex-wife Maggie in the first two Ant-Man movies. Nathan Fillion, Gunn's longtime collaborator and friend, was the voice of Monstrous Inmate in Volume 1, and he has a larger part in Volume 3 as Master Karja, the sentry foreman on the Orgoscope. Michaela Hoover was Nova Prime's assistant in Volume 1 and voices the rabbit Floor this time around. Tara Strong, who provides the voice of Mainframe, does the same for Miss Minutes in Loki. Gunn also dipped into the DC casting well for Volume 3. Daniela Melchior, who starred as Ratcatcher in The Suicide Squad, plays Yura, the Orgo Corps receptionist. Pete Davidson, who also appeared in The Suicide Squad as Blackguard, is also listed in the credits. Finally, the villainous High Evolutionary is portrayed by Chukudi Iwuji, who worked with Gunn on the TV series Peacemaker. Peter Quill isn't known for his humility. He doesn't readily admit to having weaknesses or making mistakes. He's more apt to try to talk his way out of an argument or improvise his way out of a problem than follow orders or ask for help. In Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3, he demonstrates these qualities yet again, several times over. He insists on taking Rocket to the High Evolutionary even though Gamora repeatedly warns him that it's a trap. And as Nebula points out, he and Groot nearly jump to their deaths trying to extract the secret code from an Orgo core crony's head when they don't have a better idea. Quill's impulsivity most notably got him and many others into serious trouble when he interfered with the Avengers' plan to stop Thanos from using the Infinity Gauntlet. As it dawns on him that Thanos sacrificed Gamora, he loses his cool and begins putting a beat down on the Mad Titan. This breaks Mantis's concentration, and before the rest of the gang can remove the gauntlet, Thanos is able to complete his mission and snap half of life out of existence. But in an Orgoscope elevator, Quill shows major growth, admitting his mistakes. I lost my temper and nearly destroyed half the universe. The entire speech is a hilarious summary of the otherwise tragic events of Infinity War and Endgame. Nebula says that, while he left out some important information, That is the gist of it. 
Sometimes small details mean big things for the plot, the characters, or the themes of a movie. Other times they're just a fun bit of world building, and that's the case with the Guardians of the Galaxy movies and food. What sets this franchise within a franchise apart from many other MCU properties is the extent to which its world is thought out. Characters have likes and dislikes, strengths and weaknesses, and we know them as well as their fellow characters do. Quill is partial to tight-fitting graphic t-shirts, Gamora traditionally fights with a sword but comes to appreciate Star-Lord's blasters, Groot went through an angsty teenage phase in which he struggled to lift his head from his video games, and Drax really likes Zarg nuts. Zarg nuts are the Guardian's equivalent of prepackaged airplane peanuts. In the holiday special, Drax thinks Mantis's secret is that she ate a whole bowl of Zarg nuts. Get over the Zarg nuts! In Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3, Mantis again asks for a Zarg nut, and Drax tells her they're all gone. Then he reaches back into the bag and treats himself to another. Another food-related Easter egg, during the battle on the Orgoscope, a female humanoid can be seen eating a yarrow root. That she's clearly enjoying it must mean it's ripe. This is the very same galactic fruit that Nebula hungers for in Volume 2. When she breaks out of her restraints, subdues the Ravagers and Rocket, and takes a bite, she spits it out in disgust. The Guardians had warned her that it wasn't ready to eat. Jokes about metaphors run throughout the trilogy. In Volume 1, when Quill calls Drax a walking thesaurus during the team's prison break, the Green Brawler threatens Star-Lord. Quill defends himself by explaining that it was just a metaphor, which Drax does not understand. Nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too fast. I would catch it. In Volume 2, when asked about the meaning behind his name, Taserface replies with a familiar explanation. It's metaphorical! <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 takes the literal use of metaphors to a whole new level. Mantis implores Drax to give Quill a pep talk, but he goes off script and ends up poorly explaining the difference between metaphors and analogies instead. The running metaphor joke also becomes an opportunity to call back to one of Drax's other memorable comedic moments. In Volume 2, Rocket threatens to put excrement in Quill's pillowcase and clarifies it'll be one of Drax's because his droppings are huge. At the end of his metaphor analogy monologue, Drax proudly tells Peter that even his bodily functions are figurative. One time, his fecal matter looked like a fish. Peter Jason Quill was born in 1980 in Missouri and was whisked into space by Yondu in 1988. That means all of Star-Lord's cultural references come from that eight-year period. The character, now in his 40s, has physical evidence for some of the hallmarks of his childhood. He had his backpack with him that fateful day, which Gamora, not having any memories of Peter, goes through while she's left alone on his ship. Besides the Polaroid of his family, it contains some ELF stickers and trading cards. The exterior of the book bag is decorated with patches of Pac-Man ghosts. In Volume 2, Peter turns himself into a giant cosmic Pac-Man in his final showdown against Ego, and some of those ELF stickers are plastered across the control panel of his ship. Many of Quill's verbal references harken back to the 80s as well. He calls the High Evolutionary a Skeletor wannabe. There's also an allusion to another iconic movie franchise that a young Quill would have been exposed to. At one point, Drax says, I have a bad feeling about this, which is an Easter egg of a line that gets uttered again and again in Star Wars movies. I have a very bad feeling about this. For the most part, the 31 films and 9 television series that make up the MCU have been fairly family-friendly. They've all carried a PG-13 rating, often to tip off parents about action movie-style violence, mild swearing, and pretty tame adult situations. Guardians of the Galaxy was already Marvel's sauciest sub-franchise, as the movies contain far more sexual innuendos, more casual cursing, and some of the MCU's more disturbing deaths. But Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 pushes the boundaries of its PG-13 rating like never before. Though it's also one of the funniest and most heartfelt, it's undoubtedly the goriest and most obscene installment in the MCU to date. Adam Warlock burns a Ravager down to his skeleton, and the High Evolutionary's mask of his actual face is removed, revealing the pulpy, bloody skull that was left behind after Rocket's attack. There are sex jokes aplenty, including Quill's attempt to woo Yura, and Star-Lord has the honor of letting slip the MCU's first ever F-bomb. Now what? Open the f door! It's been a long time coming, and if it was ever going to happen, it's fitting that it happened in a Guardians movie. Until now, the franchise has creatively worked around the F-word, cutting away or having Groot use it. He says, welcome to the frickin' Guardians of the Galaxy. Only he didn't use frickin'. Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2 opens with an epic comedic fight sequence set to the song Mr. Blue Sky, in which the Guardians take on an agitated obelisk. 
They're having a tough time taking the massive, toothy, tentacled creature down. Drax convinces himself that the obelisk can only be killed from the inside out since its hide is too thick. Gamora and Star-Lord realize this doesn't make sense and work together to get the beast to look up, exposing a wound under its chin. Gamora switches from blasters to blades and slices the obelisk practically in half, at which point Drax emerges from its innards, believing himself to have slain it single-handedly. In Volume 3, Nebula, Drax, and Mantis are captured by those loyal to the High Evolutionary and put in a dungeon of sorts where it's assumed three angry obelisks will make short work of them. It's a callback to that old fight, scaled up by three. But one key detail has changed. At the beginning of Volume 2, the Guardians didn't have Mantis on their side. Rather than kill the obelisks, Mantis lays hands on them and assures the team they won't be eaten. She brings the monsters under the Guardians' control and rescues them from their captivity. When Mantis goes off to find herself, she does so with a trio of obelisks in tow. Like the Marvel villains turned heroes that have come before her, Nebula has become a more likable and nuanced character. But she hasn't lost what we loved about her as a baddie. She's moody, snarky, and has a short fuse when it comes to putting up with idiots. Yet underneath her mostly cybernetic exterior, she's emotionally tough, thoughtful, and eager to be of service. Over the years, Nebula has formed a special bond with Rocket, which becomes evident when she gifts him something he'd long coveted in the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. Rocket opens a large oblong box to find Bucky's vibranium arm. He'd previously offered to buy the arm from the Winter Soldier when they fought alongside each other in Avengers Infinity War. After Bucky ignored him, Rocket remained undeterred. Okay, how much for the arm? Oh, I'll get that arm. And he did, after Nebula came through. As a thank you, Rocket innovated a new arm for Nebula, who is prone to losing limbs in both the comics and the MCU. This new arm is a weapon and a tool with seemingly infinite applications. We know that genius tinkerer Rocket is responsible for her upgrades because she gives him credit before she uses it to hack into the controls of the High Evolutionary's crashing ship. Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 is chock-full of religious undertones and imagery that aren't just Easter eggs, they're intrinsic to the movie's central theme about the dignity of all life. It's been previously established that Peter Quill's dad Ego was an evil god, and the third film features Adam Warlock's virgin birth. There's also talk of heaven and a scene that involves a dying rocket stealing a few moments with Lila in a strange limbo space. The final act, in which the Guardians use nowhere to rescue humanoids and animals alike from the High Evolutionary's ship, is a clear parallel to Noah's Ark. And on the topic of the High Evolutionary, when his intelligent designs disappoint, he washes away his creations and his worlds in a sea of flames, not unlike Noah's Flood. He claims that there are no gods, which is why he had to step in to control existence. At least in the MCU, we know this isn't strictly true. As we've seen in the Thor films and Eternals, those gods might be ambivalent and highly imperfect themselves, but they are out there. The most overt reference comes near the end when Adam Warlock uses an outstretched finger to revive a lifeless Peter Quill. The tableau is an unmistakable recreation of God giving Adam life from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel fresco, though in this instance the roles are reversed. We've discussed how what makes the Guardians weird is what makes them great. One of the weirdest things about this franchise is Groot, the sentient tree who might be a little self-obsessed. It might seem like he's only on the team for comic relief, but there's actually a much deeper meaning hidden behind the character and his three favorite words. In the first film, there's a scene in which Peter Quill, frustrated that Groot only ever says the same three words, follows him and Gamora through a passageway. In Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3, there's a mirror of that scene. This time, Ravager Gamora follows Quill through a hallway, frustrated that she can't understand the giant tree man. But by the end of the movie, Gamora has warmed to Groot. In one of many moments throughout the film's unexpectedly happy resolution, Groot nonchalantly says, I love you guys. This moment might have come as a shock to viewers, but none of the Guardians react in the slightest. That's because it symbolizes two things. First, it's representative of the fact that they all, including Ravager Gamora, understand Groot now. Second, it's meant to include the audience in their circle of friends. We can speak Groot now, too. James Gunn has indicated that he intended the first Guardians film to be an exploration of mother figures in our lives. The second film is obviously about the influence of father figures, while the third film is a parable about self-acceptance. As part of Peter Quill's journey towards self-actualization, he realizes he must make peace with his past, and that means reconciling with his grandfather. Peter and his grandpa didn't have the warmest, fuzziest relationship. 
So this isn't exactly something Star-Lord's looking forward to. When he arrives at his childhood home, where it turns out that his mother's father is still alive, we learn that his name is Jason. That's also Peter's middle name, something we became aware of back in Volume 1, when Star-Lord's holographic rap sheet revealed his full name to be Peter Jason Quill. The MCU's take on the character diverges from the comics, but his middle name is the same, even if the story behind it isn't. Star-Lord's mother in the comics was still Meredith Quill, but his father was Jason, a Spartax emperor. The powerful figure impregnated Meredith and left her to fight an interstellar war. Meredith is killed not by a tumor, but by aliens hostile to Jason, who want to end his bloodline. Marvel movies often use post credit scenes to introduce new characters. One of the only things about Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 that feels like a traditional MCU entry is that it relies on this convention. In the first post credit scene, we get a glimpse of who will serve as the Guardians of the Galaxy going forward. Rocket has been promoted to team leader. There's also Kaiju Groot, Kraglin, Cosmo, Adam Warlock, and a young blonde girl whom the rest refer to as Phyla. We can assume that this is the MCU's Phyla Vell. In the comics, she's Marvel's daughter and becomes a Captain Marvel in her own universe. In Volume 3, the character is slyly introduced when she's seen running circles on a humanoid sized hamster wheel under the watchful eye of the High Evolutionary. With the Marvels due out later this year, there's a chance she could reappear in the MCU sooner rather than later. If she's to remain a Guardian, however, her future is murkier. With Gunn's departure, there are no new Guardians projects in development. In the original Guardians of the Galaxy, Peter Quill tells tales of Earth's heroes, including the great hero Kevin Bacon. Fast forward to the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, and Mantis and Drax, wanting to get their friend the best present ever, decide to fly to Earth and kidnap Quill's personal hero. Bacon is understandably confused and afraid. Mantis uses her influence over his emotions to calm him, but when Quill realizes what they've done, he makes her break the spell. At first, Bacon is completely panicked to find himself in space, but after he and Kraglin have a heart-to-heart, -heart, the actor and the Guardians part as friends. Or so we thought. In the second post credit scene of Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3, in which Peter Quill and his grandfather Jason are having breakfast, Jason is seen reading a newspaper. The article on the left of the front page explains that Kevin Bacon claims seems to have been abducted by aliens. On the right side of the front page is an article about a pug winning a dog show. It's less obvious than the bacon easter egg, but it could refer to Blurp, who has become Adam Warlock's pet after killing its previous owner.